Well, let's get started. FP and Scarlet chapters three and four. So we'll just recap for, is anyone here for the last one? Yeah, about half. That's not too bad. So we'll just do a quick recap. Um, we covered off some simple points when it came to FP. Functions are neat. Being able to pass them around, around as values and first treat them as first class citizens is also neat. Types generally makes your life a lot easier. Polymorphic types even better. And when you combine them with polymorphic parametricity, you get the wrong slide. <laughs> but generally everything just gets a little bit more awesome. You can reason about your code, everything's predictable, and you can take a giant hatchet to it and the compiler will help you come out the other side. Here's an example, just with some parametricity, some reasoning, fast and loose, of course. We can work out from the type signature what this function may do, one of some possible implementation. We're just taking a string, some number, and something that goes from a number to a number, and returning a string. So, lots of things we can do with that, but it'd be easy to work out that Obviously, the string that you're getting back is going to be related to the string that you're getting in. And you're probably going to do something with the number you passed in with the function you, that works on numbers that you passed in. It might even have something to do with the string that comes out the other side. And just as a more polymorphic example, you're taking some array of things, array of A's, and you've got a function which will take two A's and give you some boolean value and you're getting a boolean value at the end. So you're working with an array of something and you've got a function that works on <coughs> one or two of some things that are in the array of some things. So that boolean value is probably going to roll up into the final return value. Um, but you don't actually have to worry about, in this case, anything about the A. You're not told any, you're not given any information about whether or not it's a numeric value, if it's stringly, if it's list like, if it's a transformer stack seven levels deep. It's just an A. So, after the recap, we'll just go on to our data structures. Starting with the definition, of course. Um, functional data structures are operated on by pure functions. Pure functions, when used on data structures, can perform side effects, but the benefit of them being a functional data structure is these and the pure function is the side effects can't escape from that function. So if you have something which may do in place sorting of an array, if you pass in an immutable list, it can do in place mutations, but what you get out of that is an immutable list at the end. So you don't have to worry about suddenly getting changing data or anything weird happening with the data that comes out the other side. Um, and because of the combination of the data structures themselves and the pure functions that are used on them, they're by definition immutable. So I will just go over our trusty favorite, the oldie sing singly linked list. Um, there is a couple of new things in this. Um, so sealed traits. You can see we've got a seal trait for a list of plus a. The seal trait means that all of the definitions involving the data structure must be inside this file. So when you declare a seal trait in Scala, everything that works on that data structure must be defined within that file. It can't be extended in some other part of the program. Um, and we've got two constructors. We've got a case object nil um, and our case class of cons. These represent the two states that a data structure could be in. So we've got the object of nil, which is an object because it takes no arguments. It simply exists as nil. Um, it extends a list of nothing because nil is a list of nothing. Nothing being the, I believe, the lowest type in Scala. That's uh, the right description. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a subtype of everything. Yes. Um, and we've got the cons, which actually lets us construct um, parts of our list. So we get one particular A, which is the head, and we've got the tail, which is the rest of the list. 
So I forgot what the plus symbol yeah. is again. I'm getting to the plus symbol. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the plus symbol is used as uh, variants. So basically anything in the list has to be an A or some subtype of A. So something that extends that A. So this is how they work essentially in, in memory. So the list of A and B, so we've got some um, syntactic sugar for basically how the constructor will work. Um, so a list of A and B is exactly the same as cons of A, cons B, you know, because that's how we use the constructors to build everything up. Um, and this is how it looks essentially in memory. So we've got our first element, first cons element, which has our head, which is the A, and the tau, which points to the next cons element, which is the B, and then tries to point to the rest, but because that's the end of our list, we just point to a nil, and we're done. Am I going too fast? Is everything making cool sense? Okay. But because we've defined our list as a list of A, we can actually do things like this without having to define a list that contains doubles and a list that contains ints in all separate implementations. We have one list of A which covers all of this. Um, and you can see the different constructors will just work. It doesn't matter which. And the nil is based on the type. The colon list double is a type annotation in Scala. So when you go val, is it val? val A colon and their type name, that means you want to actually specify. You're not going to use the type inference. You're going to say, I want this type to be this. So one way of thinking about different functional data structures is uh, a combination of time and state. Because the data structure, the functional data structures will often have a constructor for each possible state that the structure could be in. So for example, you saw before we had nil and cons. You either have an empty list, which is nil, or you have a cons, which means you have a non-empty list, which has one element and may contain more elements, which could be nil or it could be in other cons. Um, and these states can't change without explicit action from you. So there's no checking halfway through a function call when you accepted something and you knew it was a nil on the list, as we'll see we can do later on. There's no, you don't have to check halfway down to say, oh, what if something's been added to the list and we've now got the cons of A and C? That can't happen. If you've accepted, if you've given the information to the compiler that says, I'm dealing with a nil list here, then that's what you've got. So just as an example, this is a tree. So again, we've got our seal trait for a tree. Go with this one, still neglecting everyone over here. Um, and so the tree could be empty. So we've got, in, again, just like the list, which is empty, which extends the tree of nothing. Or we could be on the leaf. So we have uh, it's just a single element which extends our leaf and extends our tree. Or we could be at a branching point in the tree. So we could either go left or right. And if we were walking down the tree, our branch we could have on the left, we could be empty, but on the right, we could have a leaf, or we could have another branch. But as when, when we're stepping down, we're looking at a particular, bran particular branch, we just see that we've got at a branch and we've got two trees. So it keeps everything uh, explicit and helps in reasoning about things. So as I was saying, mostly you have to only worry about a single state at a time. Um, and as we'll see through pattern matching, um, you can actually tell the compiler what you're interested in and what the code of particular states is going to care about, um, which is a very powerful and useful feature. Also a wonderful time saver. And these explicit statements about what you're dealing with at any particular time, plus the immutability of the data structure itself, um, provide a lot of room for optimizations, both within your code and within the compiler need. 
So we'll just have a look at some pattern matching, which is one of the fun toys of functional data structures. Um, so we'll just define a sum function, so no polymorphism or craziness here. We've just got a list of ints, and they're going to return an int. So firstly, we take our value of ints, and we say we're going to match. That's how you start a uh, pattern match in Scala. And then it's a case of actually enumerating the constructors or the states of what you're matching on. So we just start off with our base case. We've got an empty list. If you're summing an empty list, it's pretty easy. There's really only one solution, unless you really want to ruin someone's day. Be given a zero. And the other state, you've got a cons and you've got the head and the rest of the list. And so we just want to sum the list. We already know the numbers. So we can just go the head plus the sum of the rest of the list. And so we can just call ourselves recursively and this will start to move along the list as we're deconstructing it in each case, in each pattern match. So just in case um, people haven't done much with this before, we'll just work through what that's actually doing with the individual constructors. So we've got a list of one, two, three. Um, I've broken it out into the explicit constructors just to make it easy to follow. So we've got a cons of one, which got a cons of two, cons of three, and nil, finally for the rest of the list. So remembering our function, we're going to pattern match. So it's going to go in our second match. And it's going to take the one out of the cons and go one plus sum the rest of the list, which was our x's, which is the cons two, cons three, and then nil, and then so on, until we get down to the very end, where we hit our first pattern match of nil, so it's zero. Yay! See? So it's a very simplistic way, it turns what may normally be complex recursive functions into just what do I do when the data is at this point? Or what do I do when the data is at this point? And they're separate steps, and it becomes a lot easier to work through. Otherwise, very complex data structures. Um, and also just some showing off of what some people, what some languages do with that matching. It's examples from Erlang. Um, this is a TCP segment, which comes through as binary, but Erlang can pattern match on binary code, on binary input. And this is pulling apart a TCP segment according to the spec and the byte size of each piece in order. So within the function, it just pulls out the act number, the data I've said, any flags, urgent pointers, and then they're just available as variables within the function for whatever you want to do. So as opposed to having to go through some gnarly parsing or anything like that, or relying on some frail, pot potentially frail decoding. Pattern match. Done. Next problem. So, the other advantage of um, functional data structures is the data sharing. But a off complaint often heard is, like, mutable data sounds neat, but they can't change it. I'm not supposed to actually do anything with it. Easy. You make a new one. Take the information from the old one, have a new one. I'm going to add, add numbers to all of the lists, get the first list, break it down, add the numbers up, build the list back up, give it back. Done. A common, a common phrase I've heard. So the book, this is a diagram from the book. Um, I couldn't really explain it much better. Um, so for example, if we're going to run, we've got a list of A to D, and we just want to find the tail of the list, so which is everything but the head. Um, we call that function tail, and so remember from the data constructors that if it's a non-empty list, we've got a cons. 
which is going to head and a tail. So it's a simple operation. You pull in, if you've got an unempty list, you just return the cons and ignore the head, so the second value from the cons operator. And because you can't actually modify any of the data structures, they're both immutable, that second, that result of that function is still a reference to that first, that first cons operator from the first list. They're both talking, they're both referring to the same place in memory. You can't change it. It's perfectly acceptable to do that. So you don't need to worry about defensive copying or anything like that. It's mutable. Sorted. So I'll just run through a bit of an example. So we've got a map function. Again, we've got two polymorphic arguments here. So we've got an A and a B. And we have some list of A. We don't really care what it is. Um, and then we've got some function which goes from an A to a B. So based on the type signature, if we're returning a list of B, it seems to make sense that we're going to go from one end of the list to the other and just run the function on every A. So to make it simple, we'll just pattern match on our input, see what we get. And the base case, if it's nil, so it's an empty list, not really much we can run a function on, so have an empty list. And by nature of the polymorphism on the list type, that nil is going to be our list B, and that other nil on the left is going to be our list of A, because the type inference will simply make it work. But if we're actually working on the list, we've got something to do, we've got a head and a tail, we just rebuild the list, run the function on the head, makes it, makes it into our B, turn the rest of the list into the list of B, and just wrap it back up. Easy. And for some reason I put them in separate things. So again, just make sure it's all nice and clear, we'll just work through it. Um, so we've got our list of our trusty list of one to three, and we've got a function which is just going to add one to each element in the list. So, based on the pattern matches that we saw before, we're simply going to move that function and apply it to the head of every cons element. And again, just building them back up until we get to the very end and yeah, we put it on your list. There is a bit of a problem with this though. If you do this in Scala, you've got a list, one to five, and you saw in the previous one, I had a type annotation on my input function. I said, I was explicitly going to say I want an int for the input. If we don't specify it with our type defined here, this is unfortunately where the type inference doesn't quite work in Scala. There is a solution. You can either annotate all of your functions, which is very boring, mm -hmm. or we can actually change things up a little. Notice the difference in the function definition here. The second argument to the function is, pro is provided in the second set of uh, parens. Uh, what that means, as I understand it, is it will create a function, a partially applied function, when you go map and your list, and that turns it into, that allows the compiler to create uh, or deduce more concrete types because it knows now that it has a list of ints or it knows it has a list of strings. So it's created a partially applied function that actually has a type signature of list of your concrete type to a list of the second concrete type. 
So then, when we pass in our function, have we covered anonymous functions? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Moment of panic. Um, if we pass in our function now, just in, without bothering with the type annotation. Yay! It's very convenient to do that. There's other uh, syntactic sugar for uh, writing anonymous functions or simplifying this even further. Um, if you want, you could actually omit, in this case, you could omit the x that are x entirely and replace it with an underscore. And that would create a, create an anonymous function or a partially applied function that would expect something that works with plus one. And would also... Sorry. I don't even you can complete that sentence. <laughs> That's why it was like a, a gentle... <laughs> Um, and also uses the information from the like the type signature of the function you're passing it into to create the type signatures it needs for passing in that information. So, functional data structures are extremely cool. I've only covered one really of any interest at this point, which is the list. Um, we saw trees momentarily. Um, there is an entire universe of incredibly awesome functional data structures out there. Um, Okasaki um, has a book called Purely Functional Data Structures. Um, it's kind of a big deal. He was one of the main people that proved functional data structures could be as efficient, if not more efficient, and sometimes uh, faster than all of their imperative and intensely mutable counterparts. Um, I've not finished going through it. Um, my brain is not that big, but it's an incredibly good book and I highly recommend it. Um, additionally, chapter three in FB and Scala is just packed with exercises. Uh, pulling apart data structures and the general functions that work on them um, and just really building up a strong base of knowledge. So I really recommend, um, I've deliberately avoided going through a lot of, lot of examples um, so I'm sorry if that would have actually been helpful, but you should go work through the exercise in the book because they're excellent and you really get a lot from them. So, does anyone have any questions about the first bit, first chapter? Yeah? Um, so after you've rearranged your map function to help with the uh, type inference, what if you want to create a, a the one of a better word derivative of Mac that has that is concrete on a particular function. Is there a flip in Scala? Because you've got the you've got list first and then the and then function from A to B? Um, I don't believe there is. You could just define a function that passes in the arguments in the order that you like. Um, but I'm not aware of any flip yeah. in Scala. There might be one in Scala Z, but I don't know of it. Yeah. Is there any particular reason why you have to have a Mac around that way? Uh, other than if you uh, did it the other way, you're back to the same problem. Yeah. Like the function isn't defined enough. Mm. You've got to define one of them before you do the function. Uh, you'd be better off just defining it as two parameters if you wanted to go the other way around, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Or you could always put the square braces in when you call map rather than... There's a lot of different places that you can put the types in. But Generally, I guess in Scala and Scala Z land, you probably find both variants of the functions around the place. Right. Like you'll see fold in the standard library, which is one way, and then you'll see it the other way in Scala Z, and you'll just pick which one actually infers better based yeah. on what you're doing. Right. So why is local type inference there not working properly? I mean, obviously that's a pretty pretty common way to write Scala code. Is there something inherent to Scala or JVM, or is it? I believe it's a Scala issue, um, because if you've got both parameters coming out at the same time, um, as I understand it, I don't have a deep understanding of it, it just doesn't have enough information at the time to be able to work out what the A and B should be on the F that you're passing in. So even though you're passing in something which is like a list of end, and just going X plus one, come on, it's not hard, but it still doesn't seem to be able to work it out. So until you give it the separated parameters so it can actually kind of do that first step of creating a partially applied function which has a new type signature based on your input it doesn't quite have enough info to work it out 
So I lost some weird things that at face value sound really dumb, but then when you load into your brain all the things that it's doing with implicit conversions mm -hmm. and subtyping, the search space is incredibly large. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do some things that seem intuitive, unfortunately, just because it has such a big, the type checker has such a big space. Still like Hingley Milner, no, Hingley Milner, type inference interacts it, with it implicit. It's not, it's not, it, it's it not. isn't. It is. Yeah, it is not. not because of the subtype. <laughs> it's inside out from that, which is why it chokes yes. in these various cases. Sorry. Yeah, so just with um, that Okasaki pure functional data structures, does it do like, um, like a matrix implementation or things like that? Um, I can't actually remember. <clears throat> I, I was just curious whether like there's like immutable fast implementation. Uh, in Okasaki directly, I don't remember if there is. It doesn't deal with the matrix. Yeah. There isn't? I don't think so. He might have done it in his follow-up stuff. Yeah. Because uh, he's had, he's actually done two things. That that thing was like ages ago, and then he's done follow-up work. But I'm not sure. Um, and his, his PhD was yeah, yeah. in research topics on it, whereas the, the book's more you know, commonly understood middle data structures. But it's also simple structures to get the techniques across. We had a show that it's in our chairs for this piece that you know, works in the time and space you'd expect in the presence of lasers and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Crack on with chapter four. Family errors without exceptions. There we go. So, throwing exceptions. That's a side effect. We would rather be dealing with your functions. Mostly, side effects aren't all bad. But exceptions aren't exactly our favorite side effects. So we try to just give them. We try and actually just turn them into values or use values instead entirely. And everything becomes a lot more interesting. So we've just got this terrible function, which will fail quite hard. Um, we define at the top our value, y, and we just tell the compiler that it's got a type of int, um, which works because of how the, the types of the exceptions are defined. It's basically will match whatever type. Um, so we do a try, add our numbers, and then see if we catch anything. And in the catch in scholars, they use a um, pattern match. So the case is the catch is essentially the start of a match expression. So in this case, we're just catching everything of type exception. So you can see we've got our type annotation, case E. So we don't particularly care the structure of E. We just care that its type is exception. One of the problems with this, though, is that Y is not referentially transparent. So between the two examples, if we take referential transparency, it means we should be able to take the value of that function, or the body of that function, and put it where its value is used, and the meaning of our program has not changed. However, if we try that here, this breaks horribly. So we just, we can't make any assumptions about code that uses exceptions. They're not referentially transparent. All of a sudden, the execution of the function is context dependent. So it depends on where it's executed and what's happening at the time. And generally speaking, exceptions aren't type safe. Because if you look at the signature for our function, it takes an int and returns an int. So we would assume that it's a pure function and we can use that safely everywhere. But all of a sudden, we've got this little time bomb in our code. So we've just got an exception waiting to happen, but we know nothing about it because we've only got an end. So, as George would say, that's not good enough. <laughs> so, we'll just define a mean function and we'll work through how we can make this better, how we can make this actually more reliable and we can reason about it easier. Um, so, so we've got a mean of some 
sequence of doubles. Sequence in Scala is a common interface to basically any linear collection. So lists, arrays, sets, I think, are, also, are all sequences. Um, but fortunately, it's a partial function as well. Because if we pass in a list which is empty, all of a sudden we get a horrible explosion. So, what can we do about this? There's a couple of different things based on our type signature. So, without changing the type signature, we could return some other terrible value, which just sort of is this is our failure value. Sort of the sentinel value, I think, is called in some other places. So, you could return like 0.0. .0. Maybe you could return null, not a number. All really interesting things. But doing that in your code, returning something which sort of just stands for an error. So oh, in this case, it means an error. It leads to code like this, which is just terrible. It's annoying to write, because you're just constantly checking for if this, not this, then you can do the next step. So you either end up with what Katie Miller called tornado code, which just goes down and across the screen with if checks and everything like that. It's also not usable on polymorphic code. Because how do you have a sentinel value for polymorphic return value? Can't return negative one. What if I'm expecting a string? So we have to find a better solution. Could use defaults. It's still not good enough. So we pass in a value that we know this is going to be our what we get, this is going to be the value that we get if it's empty. Seems reasonable. Our function's now total. For all inputs, we know what's going to happen. But now we're just still stuck with saying what our sentinel value is. So now we just have to give it the sentinel value. So we still really haven't improved on the situation that we had before. So how can we make this a little better? Da, 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 da. So this is the option type in Scala. It's defined slightly differently in the standard libraries, but fundamentally, this is what it is. So similar to our list, we have a sealed trait or option of A. So option could be of anything. It could be a list of any things. And we have a known case, which is basically nothing. Thankfully, it's not a null pointer. Very different. This is your friend. Null pointers aren't. And then we've got a case class of sum, which means we actually have something. We have that value, that sum value, sum a. So now let's see what we can do. Changed up our, had to change our type signature a little. But at the same time, not really. We're taking a sequence of doubles, and we would expect that we're going to get a double count. But the option value tells us that that's not necessarily true. It's still the total function, but something could go wrong that means we don't necessarily get what we want. So in the first case, now if it's empty, we just say, none. That's it. Solved. And in case of actually having a non-empty list, we can just return something, which is our value. Might be good enough. <laughs> um, again, the function is total, like last time, except now we actually have a meaningful return value. The type unambig unambiguously and explicitly states that then that you can pass in inputs to this function and you may not necessarily actually get the answer that you would hope for. So option comes from many, it's got different applied patterns. Um, for example, if you're looking up a map, so if you have a map and you just pass in a key, option you might get a value out. You don't know until you actually run the code, but it makes you handle the error case. You've got to think about what's going on. And there's other things like head option and last option. So 
if you pass it, if you've got a function which is head, that's a partial function because it's going to do if you give it an empty list. The head of an empty list is usually just pain. But if you've got head option, you can actually go over none. It's like, oh, okay, got an empty list. The advantages of this fun of the option type is that it actually lets us create generic patterns for handling these these things in our code. And the functions only have to be written once, and then we can just use them. Yay. So, look at the trait object for option. Trait objects have to be defined in the same file as the seal trait for which they're defined on in Scala. So, for example, if you've got functions that you want to operate on a given option of A, so some, so some 3.0, if that was our result from the last one, you want to be able to call the map function on, or flat map or something like that. These let you go value dot function name. Um, they're similar to the companion objects. Um, companion objects are usually more miscellaneous collections of functions on a given type. Um, but these are all functions, trade objects contain functions you would expect to operate on precisely that, um, that value. You notice on our get or else function, um, we've got this fat arrow B, we've got nothing on the left of the fat arrow. That means that B won't be evaluated until we actually need it. So it's like a lazy, it's a lazy value. Um, and the terrifying type options um, mean that B must be some super type of A. So, and that's because option is defined as the plus A. So anything in that option has to be something that extends A, but the thing coming out on the other side, the B in this case, can be an A, or it can be any other type. Any other type, sorry. Um, option is si or similar or analogous to the list. So if you think of a list of one element, so it can be empty, which is none, or you'll have one element, which is your sum value. So we'll just do a couple of those option functions and see where we're going. So if we've got, if we're going to take a, we'll run a map function for option. So this is going to, actually put a type signature up, that might help. Um, this is going to run on some optional value. So we've got an option A, and we're going to call dot map on that option. So we need, we've got an A to a B, and we've got some optional A value. What's going to be first in our match? What will we handle? Just handle first, get it out of the way. No. Handle none. Anyone want to guess what we're just going to do if we get none? Turn none. Turn none. Done. So our functional data structures kicking in. So in a particular state where you've got nothing, and you want to apply a function to nothing, don't even have to bother. Just return nothing. So in the other case? Some. Some. Everyone's so awake. I shouldn't be doing this to you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> simple enough. In the case match, we're able to go with the second constructor of sum of A. So we've got our value, A. We actually want to return a B. We've only got one thing which will turn it into a B, which is our F. Turn it into the B, wrap it back up in a sum, and return it. Now we're done. And at this one. This one's slightly more interesting. So we've got some optional value of A, 
But now our function will take that A and return another option of B. So not just a B this time. So for example, if you've got one function that could fail, you've got another function that could fail, but you need that first value. Again, handle our base case first. Get rid of that value. And then, other case, take the value, deconstruct the sum, and return a value. There's more than one way to define this function. Um, it's one of the nicer examples that's touched on a couple of times in this chapter in the book. You do it one way, learn a bit more to find some other functions, come back and do it a better way. Sorry, I wouldn't want to deprive you of that. So let's actually use option for something, as opposed to just getting the mean values of the list, because it's an angry list. So we have some case class of an employee. We have an employee record. So in Scala, this is similar to a Haskell record, or some object which has just got a name, a department, and it might have a manager. So in our value, we've got an option which might contain another employee. And then we've just got a function. Don't need to worry too much about the definition for our purposes which takes a name. So we want to find an employee by their name. But that could fail. So an option of the employee. So in this case, we just do a look, we'll just do a simple lookup. We'll try and find Joe in whatever list we have. And then if we have Joe, if we get a result back, we're going to map over that. So we're going to take our A, and we're going to turn it into a B, in which, in this case, we're going to try and find the department for Joe. So this is an example of the underscore syntax. So you've got a function which goes from an A to a B. So you're getting an employee, and you'd like to take it to a department. So you call the department function on the only thing that was passed into that function, which was your employee. So it's just underscore dot department. But that function map is only run if Joe is actually an employee. If that first function lookup by name returned nothing, map wouldn't do anything. We saw in the definition before. There's nothing for it to do. And then we can get a bit more complex. So you remember from the definition, the manager on the employee was an optional value. So, not all of us have a boss. Most of us have some sort of a boss, though. Um, so we want to find out who's Joe's who Joe's manager is. But if you remember, the manager on the data structure was an optional employee, so they might not have one. So if we were just to call map on that first one, you get some employee back, and then you the result would actually be some manager that would then be inside your some employee. So you'd have some, some, and then the actual information. Remember from the type of flat map, takes an A to an option of B, and operates on an option of A. So in this case, Joe could fail, in which case, doesn't have a manager. Or we get some manager if Joe is in the system, and he has a manager. Is this making sense so far? Mm -hmm. And now we can get really crazy. Uh, sort of. So we look up Joe, could not be there. Like before, we just get the department out. But we've still got an optional value. We still don't know. We still have no guarantee at compile time if we're actually going to get a value. But we need something to return. We need a department. In this case, we can call our get or else function which takes an A, and then if we've got some value, it actually gets the A out of the something. If we have nothing, we get our, our or else value. So if we have a department, we get it. 
If not, we just get default. Easy, saves time. The advantage, though, is that often there's multiple points of failure along a particular computation. You might get a little bit of data from over here, which might not be there, but then you have to calculate something on it, which might give you the answer that you want, and then you have to run it on something else, which might not be there either. Um, flat map, that value from A that runs on the A to the option B, allows you to combine these computations, computations with multiple points of failure. Because as we saw in the pattern match, as soon as we hit that first nothing, that first none, that's it, computation's done. We're just going to return nothing. So for example, none.flatmap, pass it in a function, doesn't matter what that function's going to do, there's actually nothing for it to do. So we just return. Um, and yeah, as I point out, exercise 4.2 in chapter 4 is a really good example of this. I recommend working through it. Um, and just a point, don't be tempted by the dark side and this sort of truly terrible code. Don't go to all that trouble and then just throw an exception anyway. You'd be braver than that. It's called get. No. What can go wrong? See, I haven't <laughs> even mentioned the function. <laughs> this is the trade off this side and then throughout the scale. Get already. is a. Now that it's been. Oh, cat's out of the bag now. Yes. Um, get is a partial function. So if you have an optional value and you just call get, you just want to get the value out of it, um, it will basically detonate if you give it a none. Um, or you might actually get the value out. You don't know. <laughs> Sorry, if you're a gambling person, use get. <laughs> and it detonates is it throw a specific it throws an exception. Yes. But a particular exception. Uh, Always one no exception. I think it explicitly throws a runtime exception right. that says no yeah. not get. Yeah. That's but that can be pretty surprising if it's four layers and two co-workers away from you where it gets a go rather than <laughs> looking at pure code going, no, yeah, this is fine. fine. No. No, no, I promise that most of the time this should have the value. <laughs> There are other distinct advantages to being able to handle these exceptions as values. Because as you saw, what we're not actually dealing with, ex with exceptions anymore. We're just dealing with another value in our code. The advantage is that this value can now actually represent an error. But because it's a value, and that's what we're really good at dealing with, we can do all sorts of things. And because we've got functions as first class values, things get even better. So, we can return them as we return the value, the errors. We can actually move all of the error handling into generic functions. So we create patterns and things like that. Just moves, it gets moved off into generic functions. Things can be handled the same way. Um, simplifies everything. When you see a particular structure, you know how it can be handled because those functions already exist. Um, several computations can be, form, be performed at once. So if you have something which is a chain, which is only worth computing if you get that first value, you can just combine all of your different computations and just at the end of all of that, then you actually care. Because it's like it will only run the functions after that first one if, that, if the previous functions have actually completed successfully. So you can defer your error checking until you actually need to care about that value. And then you can either return other things, or if you need to, you can finally return an exception. There are occasionally times where it's okay. And plus, the compiler helps. So if you've got a functional data structure which you're using to handle these errors, the functional data structure, as we talked about, will have different states. You've got a constructor for each different state it could be in. So if you've got pattern matching at different places, the compiler, I'm not sure if it's on by default, Compiler will yell at you if you don't have every case managed. So you've got exhaustiveness checking for your error handling. But 
just having to call flat map and then map and flat map and map to flat map and map on everything it does get a bit tedious. So Scala gives you some syntactic sugar in the way on the shape of four comprehensions. So a four just starts with four, open bracket, and then your different possibly failing functions. And the failing functions are then combined into flat maps. But the final value down here, the yield, is mapped over that last value. So you can think of each of the um, you can think of each of these values as being flat mapped over their previous values. It allows you just to create a nice sequence of operations. Everything's explicit, but it's still the same functions underneath. It's still flat map. So you get all of the benefits of that. So if this first function failed, the result of this whole computation would be nothing, would be none. So you don't lose the benefits of being able to have multiple computations that all could possibly fail, but you don't have, don't really, you're not really interested in handling each individual failure separately. You can use a full comprehension as one solution to just do them. If the one in the middle fails, whole thing's done. And it's just a nice way of writing them. But naturally, option isn't our only option. Uh, um, none doesn't tell us very much. If you just get a none back and you've been chaining your computations together, it doesn't tell you. Did the second one fail or did the last one fail? Or did the first one fail? It's hard to tell. So it would be nice if there was something which we could actually use. And there is. Surprise, surprise. So this is the either type. But the either, unlike the option, has two values, parameterized over two values. We have an E and an A. And the constructors, an either value can be either left or right. The left value takes the E, the right value takes the A. So it's one way to represent a disjoint union between types, because you can't have an either which is left and right. It is either left or right. Um, convention based on a pun has right containing the successful values. Um, so in the case of translating an option, the sum would be the right. So you put it on the right. And the left is where you would wrap up some actual information about an error. So this is one example of something where we could use an either. So we've got our mean function again, and our return type is now an either or string or a double. So the right value is success, the left value is failure. So in the case of the loop being empty, we return a left and we say, we, you ask for the mean of an empty list. Can't get that, so have a value. Otherwise, we say right with the actual successful value. But there is one possible problem with this. It's still returning, it's essentially just returning a string value. You have a left, you have a string. You can either pattern match and try and pull out the, actu the exact string value of that and do something with it. Or as you become more advanced and you create your own data structures for handling different error cases and things like that, that string would become our arithmetic exception. And you would have a particular type which says, you gave me an empty list. And then you could do something more meaningful with it. String will suffice for now. So we'll just try and actually do something with there either again. So similarly to the option value, either has higher order functions. Um, so we've got a person, and we have two different types. The person's made up of a name and an age. Um, they're using sealed classes this time. The sealed class, again, can be extended outside of the package they're created in. Um, so it's a way to just wrap up what would be 
a trivial and kind of non-informative value like string. String doesn't tell you anything. It could be empty, it could be thread, you could require particular structures, but a seal, a seal class lets you actually go, I need this string, I'm going to use it as a name. And then the compiler helps you all check if you just pass in a random string as opposed to something which is actually a name. So in this case, we're doing just that. We've got something which takes a string and gives it back an either of a string or a name. And then again, with the age, So we can actually, using everything that we've got at the moment, we can actually take a string and an age, and we want a person in the end. But we know, based on the type signatures, that these function, either of these functions can fail. So we need to repre re yeah, represent that in the type. So we've got our possible error case of the string. But then we don't want to have to be bothered with the flat mapping multiple times and then mapping over the result when we've got a cleaner way of expressing what's going on. So we use our full comprehension and we get, so we make the name, which is either going to be the string or the actual name. Then we make the age, assuming we still haven't failed. We've just got a name value and an age value. And then finally, we're going to map over that with our yield and just return the person. And the full comprehension, because of how empty sugars, will turn this into the either string or person. So we'll get wrapped up as a right. If we hit the yield, and we get our person at the end. So, but name's not long enough, or it's actually 200 lines of SQL injection code, then this will fail, returns a left, and we get the error at, this, at the end of that will be a left and then some informative value. I'm not putting too many people to sleep. Hey. So we've covered some of the problems with using exceptions. Can't really use them with, can't rely on type signatures anymore if you've got exceptions. Um, so much easier if we just turn them into values and then we've got all of the tools we need to, do, to deal with them. Um, covered some simple cases of handling some purely functional errors. Um, showed off the option either types a little bit. Um, they're really just the beginning. The chapter's good in expanding on those and drilling them, but there's, again, like the functional data structures, there's plenty of opportunities and interesting types out there. Um, and we showed that with errors as values, we can then use higher order functions to actually capture error handling patterns. So if we have particular types of errors, we can just use the functions that already exist just to handle them and just get on with what we're actually interested in. And the higher order functions will take care of what would have been boilerplate. Um, and the effects as values, so the errors as values, I think is what I meant to say. Is covered is brought up many other times in the book as well. So it's a really useful skill to have as it comes up quite a bit. And similar to the last chapter, there's a lot of really solid exercises in this chapter. It's that's a good grounding for what's for what's coming. Um, and that's it. The end. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or people be keen to pizza or you said that exceptions are still useful? Why? Um, because eventually if you get to some point, if you don't have an application that's just do this and close, do this and close, then you may have if you have an application only doing that, then you can return your final error value as an actual result of the application. But if you have a long running application, it may be useful to, at some point, just throw an exception so then it can just be caught by something else and then without killing the entire application. There are other ways um, of actually handling that, so you don't actually, you can still use errors as values throughout the whole application, you don't have to use exceptions at all. Um, but there are times when it's like, just, you just throw an exception 
and move on. If you had a, a, a case where you could not possibly recover, and there'd be no possible way that a co could, piece of code could do anything, it's probably okay. Um, if you need to terminate the entire thing, yeah. yeah. By the way, soften the draw exceptions. Yeah. Yes. Mess something up. Throw, kill the whole thing, which is like a not call system exit. Like, if you want a more meaningful exit, the system. Okay. Cool. Sweet.